Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the types of receptors. Okay, so we've just discussed type 1 receptors, which are these ligand-gated ion channels, and we've discussed the three subfamilies of ligand-gated ion channels. So we're now going to move on to type 2 receptors. Okay, and the type 2 receptors are uh, the family of G-protein coupled receptors. And for short, the G-protein coupled receptors are often abbreviated to the GPCRs. So the G is for G, uh, the P is for protein, and then the C is for C, uh, sorry, is for coupled, and then the R is for R receptors. Okay, so this is GPCRs, like so. Okay, now G protein coupled receptors also have another name. They uh, also go by the name of seven transmembrane receptors. Okay, and this is because their characteristic feature is that they have seven transmembrane domains, basically. They have seven membrane spanning alpha helices. And we don't really know why nature has latched onto this seven transmembrane uh, domain structure, basically. G protein coupled receptors are by far the most common receptors in all of biology. There's 800 of the things, basically, 800 different. G protein coupled receptors. And you find them in all eukaryotic cells, and even in prokaryotic cells, you find seven, uh, well, you find receptors with seven uh, transmembrane domains. So we don't understand really why nature has grabbed onto this and run with it, basically. We don't understand the significance of the seven uh, transmembrane domains, but it is a structure that is conserved hugely within biology. Okay, so, uh, seven transmembrane receptors, and for short, seven transmembrane receptors can be abbreviated to seven TM receptors. Okay, uh, there is also one other name uh, that is used for G-protein coupled receptors, and again, it's neuroscientists that generally use this. So, it, the same people who use ionotropic also use this word, and basically they call them metabotropic receptors. Okay, uh, but again, uh, you wouldn't catch a pharmacologist using that term. <laughs> okay, right, so let's have a little look at the basic structure of a G protein coupled receptor. So, if this is the um, membrane, basically, let's say it's the plasma membrane, uh, then the basic membrane spanning topology of a G protein coupled receptor is that you have the amino terminus extracellularly. And then you have some sort of extracellular domain, so I'll just show this like so. Okay, then you have the seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, then you'll have some sort of intracellular domain, maybe like so. And then you'll have the carboxylic acid terminus over here. Okay, so this is the basic structure of a G-protein coupled receptor. And the most important feature is that it will always, always have the seven membrane-spanning alpha helices there. That is the characteristic feature that, uh, ca you know, that is... Um, that is the G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, right. Now, uh, these receptors are generally quite fast, okay? They will uh, generally elicit responses which occur in seconds, and I should have actually just said that when we we're talking about uh, the um, ligand-gated ion channels. The responses that you get from ligand-gated ion channels are the fastest. You know, they mediate fast transmission uh, between neurons, and it, it occurs within milliseconds, basically. The signal is transferred uh, within milliseconds. G-protein coupled receptors are the next closest. Uh, they are uh, quite fast. They occur in seconds, basically. Okay, so uh, let's give an example of a G-protein coupled receptor. So probably the most famous example um, is acetylcholine acting on muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So we've seen that the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are uh, cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. They're in that nicotine-like uh, receptor family of ligand-gated ion channels. Uh, but the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, those are G-protein coupled receptors. So acetylcholine will bind to the uh, G-protein coupled receptor and trigger downstream pathways. The beta adrenoreceptors, sorry, well, all the adrenoreceptors are also examples of G-protein coupled receptors.
Okay, so we won't say any more about those now, we'll save it for the rest of the playlist, and we'll move on to the next two types. So type 3 next. So type 3 receptors are what are known as kinase-linked uh, and related receptors. Okay, so initially this family was just the kinase-linked family of receptors. However, now it's sort of been broadened a little bit. It's sometimes called the enzyme-linked um, receptors, but I think that's a bit of a bad name because G-protein-coupled receptors, they also have enzymes. You know, that they, they the binding of the ligand to a G-protein-coupled receptor activates its catalytic activity with regards to uh, interacting with G-proteins. So I think enzyme-linked isn't too helpful, uh, but they are sometimes called the enzyme-linked receptors. Uh, so this is the kinase-linked and related receptors. Okay, uh, so we're going to see that they usually have protein kinases linked to them, uh, but they can have guanylalcyclases linked to them. There's another major example where they have guanylalcyclases linked to them. So basically, the structure of kinase linked uh, and related receptors is that they have a single membrane spanning alpha helix, okay, and then they have some sort of extracellular domain here, okay. Then they have an amino terminus, which is extracellularly. And then they have uh, an intracellular domain, which is the catalytic domain. This is the enzyme portion. And then they have a carboxyl terminus down here. Okay, so this is the basic structure of a kinase-linked uh, and related receptor. Okay, so uh, this enzyme at the bottom, which is the catalytic domain, this can either be a protein kinase, which means that it adds phosphate groups onto uh, certain residues of proteins, okay, so it can either be a protein kinase, or it can be a guanylal cyclase, which means that it uh, produces um, cyclic GMP. Okay, and there's one major example of a member of the type 3 receptors which has a guanylal cyclase linked to it. Okay, so let's give some examples of um, um, type 3 receptors which have protein kinases linked to them and those which have adenylyl, sorry, guanylyl cyclases linked to them. Okay, uh, so protein kinase, the archetypal example would be the insulin receptor. Okay, so the receptor to insulin is a type 3 receptor and it has a protein kinase linked to its uh, intracellular portion. Uh, guanylal cyclase, the major example of this is atrial natriuretic peptide. Okay, and what you might uh, realize about these um, two examples here, the atrial natriuretic peptide receptor and the insulin receptor, uh, they are both proteins. So atrial natriuretic peptide and insulin are both proteins. So the ligand for these type 3 receptors is generally a protein, whereas the ligand for G protein coupled receptors and ligand gated ion channels can generally be a small molecule, basically. Okay, so they generally have peptide ligands rather than small molecule uh, ligands. Okay, and other receptors that would be in this family are, for instance, the growth factor receptors are huge members of this family. And again, they're responding to growth factors, which are peptides. Okay, now, generally what will happen is these receptors will activate cascades, which activate transcription factors, which then affect um, gene expression within the cell. So their effect generally takes hours. So we've seen ligand-gated ion channels uh, their effect is in within milliseconds. We've seen G-protein coupled receptors, their effect is in within seconds. And now we're seeing these kinase-linked receptors, uh, which have effect within hours. Okay, so uh, let's now turn to type 4 receptors. So the type 4 receptors are called the nuclear receptors. And this is a little bit of a misnomer because uh, some of them are present within the cytoplasm and just migrate to the nucleus uh, once uh, their ligand has bound to them, basically. Okay, so basically these are either in the cytoplasm or they're actually in the nucleus. Okay, and when their ligand binds to them, they um, 
will either translocate to the nucleus if they're in the cytoplasm, if they're already in the nucleus, then they don't need to do that. And once they get to the nucleus, what they will then do is they will be able to bind to DNA, okay, and they will act as transcription factors, basically. They'll change gene expression within the cell. So again, their effects are going to be seen within hours. And the major examples of nuclear receptors are the receptors to steroids, but you also have other examples of nuclear receptors. For instance, the receptors for thyroid hormones are also uh, nuclear receptors. And then a few more niche ones, the receptors to retinoic acid and vitamin D as well, uh, those are uh, nuclear receptors. Okay, uh, So a good range of these type 4 receptors as well. Right, so that now concludes our discussion of the four different types of receptors. We have ligand-gated ion channels, which act within milliseconds. We have G-protein-coupled receptors, which act within seconds. We have uh, kinase-linked and related receptors, which again produce uh, changes in gene expression eventually, and those take hours. And finally, we have these type 4 nuclear receptors. And the key thing about those is that they are within the cytoplasm or the nucleus. They're not within the plasma membrane. Okay, so their ligand needs to be able to get across the plasma membrane to be able to see them. Okay, so for instance, steroids, those are huge, great hydrophobic molecules which can just diffuse straight across the plasma membrane and therefore get to their receptors, which are either in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. Okay, and that now concludes our discussion of the four different types of receptors. In the next video in this play, there's what we'll turn our attention to is the different subfamilies of G-protein coupled receptors.